Uh, you've got the mag, touch mag. You've got the DJs who started playing it. You've got X, Y, Z, all of this stuff going on. Yeah. Radio. Radio playing it, blah, this, that, whatever. So, so you, you talked about the fact that you named that mix the touch mix. Yeah. Obviously, your affection for touch was clearly quite strong. So how do you yeah. feel from your side? getting the support from Touch Magazine, what are your feelings towards well, it's Touch really, Magazine? Yeah, it's, it's all of that, it's like really important. It's like, you know, yeah, again, we can't stress it enough, but there weren't that many either publications, it's only a couple, really, what was Echoes, Touch, blah, there's only a few that were really kind of going, okay, you're a British act, yeah, yeah, come, no, we like your stuff. Interview. Blah, this, that, X, Y, Z. You know, there's only a few. But the funny thing is, is as history's proved, you know, SBTV, when media does go, mm. no, 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 I accept you and I'm going to large you up, actually, you know, it, it, it becomes a business. You know, it becomes a thing mm. because people do want it. But... It, there weren't that many publications. There weren't. I'm not sure Touch ever came in business. <laughs> no, but I'm just. Yeah, but I, I, no, and also it's interesting because actually, without the power of your own ability to promote and distribute, which obviously everyone has now, you're kind of hampered. You know, your hands are tied, and so even even at Touch's height, which I would say was probably around '96, '97, when it was like it got from underground to like quite mainstream, but it was still. It had that kind of still had that soul, and and everyone was like into what, what was such going to say, and like and that was important. But we, are, you know, Double H missed control of what we had to touch. You know, yeah. it, the record shots was people we knew because we started to try to cover. Yeah, us. we could me and you, Jam. We we could spend two days. Me, you, and Dave Lambert could spend and Bill Tucky could spend two days driving around every single record shot in the whole of London. One hundred and twelve of them there was. And like we'd give each of them like you know, five hundred copies or two hundred copies or whatever, and then we just come back you know next month, but that gets you to like what yeah. a few thousand, ten thousand. Mm. You can't get beyond that unless yeah. oh you got to have double H Smith now. Okay, yeah. all right. Well, how does that work? Oh well, that's not going to work actually because you haven't got pop stars on your cover. Yeah. And so actually, you become very um, quickly, and and actually that that was the world we're in, and I think it's amazing now. And I, I'm amazed by the, like, you know, the SPs and, um, you know, and, even, and it, yeah, and, 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 and even like, you know, even when they started, all the kids started in like the early 2000s with the DVDs and the Risky Roads mm. and the, all those mm. people that started putting their, they're just putting themselves out and it's getting there. They don't need anyone. They don't need yeah, anyone yeah. to do anything. And we were still probably the tail end of the direction. We still yeah. needed permission. Yeah. Authority. We need, we need to be allowed to Gate, do it. The gatekeepers. Basically. Yeah. And now yeah. it's completely the other way around. Now, obviously, you've got the you know, the Grime Dailies and the those people that are just, link up TV. Yeah. They they don't need <laughs> they don't need not only do they not need your permission, but they don't want your permission. Like not having your permission makes them great. Yeah. Lord of the and, mics. Yeah. yeah exactly. exactly. Yeah. Right. The whole the whole Grime world comes from people who took control of their media yeah. and put it out there. They give a fuck what anyone was saying. No. They didn't need anyone to give them that authority. But they could do it because they had the internet. And even pre-YouTube, uh, no, obviously YouTube's a kind of game changer. Yeah, but totally, But yeah. even pre-YouTube, you could put it out in the record shops and you could have that um, that, 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 that level of um, exposure. And I guess we were still the tail end of old media. There wasn't, you know, in the because we didn't have the ability. Like, as much as we were believing, like, we could not, we could only go so far. And I guess probably the ones that were doing um, the, the biggest uh, business with the kind of new music coming out of, of, of Britain. And just look at, look, look at the fact that, look, well, our experience of Britain and London in the 90s was the influence and sound system and early, you know, and jungle and drum and bass. And like, you know, but actually, what was the world looking at? If you looked at Britain from the, through the telescope from space, you'd be seeing Britpop. Yeah. And you know, Oasis and Blur and like which is fine, you know, they can do that thing, but like the world we're a part of was not getting any attention at all and now that world does get attention because no one, no one needs them anymore. They can do it themselves. No, but the funny, think, funny no, thing, that's that's important. Yeah. But the funny thing about that was often I mean I, we I mean, we had a gig and take that turned up. Do you know what I mean? 
Yeah. It was like Robbie or whatever. Yeah. You know, or like the classic thing everyone, you know, twice as nice, Jay Z was going up. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Because that Source. underground that yeah. underground was actually the underground. Yeah. Rather yeah. than the idea of the but I think now it's very um it's it's very powerful that you can create you could be young and create if you were doing what the Imbus was doing in nineteen ninety now, you'd have a whole different, you know, set of um ways that you could go and distribution and you know yeah. promotion and yeah. and you wouldn't need and as much as like you're you know you had the silver own the morning bob yeah and that worked yeah and, and it got you to that level but mm. there's a lot of people that didn't have that no i know and i think that our 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 scene and not, not to be a down on it but that very kind of post rave kind of mm. well actually kind of contemporary to rave but that culture that was coming out of london which was all about DIY, warehouse, you know, Norman J, Jazzy, you know, the, the family function. <clears throat> yeah, and, th and then it became the raves and like that energy and that create that creativity and that, you know, the, the content that came out of that kind of hit a wall. Some things went through and became, you know, Nelly Hooper, became yeah. like a, a global Huge. Wall slip. Massive. But you know, and, and great, but a lot of people didn't because they did not have the opportunity. And I yeah. think now, in the grime and the post grime era, You'll ne you'll never be you'll never be stopped like that because those people that would once have stopped you mm. now are trying to catch up with you. Yeah, and that's absolutely. the big difference. They yeah. they're tr they're running to catch up, and if yeah. they're lucky, yeah. they'll catch up. And if they don't, see you later. Well, that, I mean, that's more the record labels now and are now playing catch up with the artists and trying to grab them before they go too far. Mm. That they don't need the label anymore. Um, but but talking about your ascendancy, so you know you broke through at, at the peak. You were supporting Michael Jackson. Mm. Um, people like that. So, so how how quickly did all that happen? How did it all? I was pretty. It was pretty quick. It was pretty quick. We we. Uh, what year are we in now? Ninety. Was well, the first album ninety two. Yeah, ninety two. So, but I think Jacko was ninety two. Was it? Yeah. We split it up. We we're only in ninety ninety two. We were in it for about three hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dangerous talk. We can move it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Dangerous was ninety two. Um, yeah, Jacko. Again, a bit of fortune, really. One of he had cancelled um, some shows in the UK, which meant that the people that yeah. were supporting him, they all had other commitments. Yeah, so they couldn't come back. So there was this gaping hole oh, for the, the influence show told me, yeah, me, me. Yeah, a live <laughs> act, and we just got told by you know our <clears throat> management that we were one of a few people that had been put forward and then we were at the rehearsal room because they said look you should prepare a bit and blah blah but just in case <laughs> a little bit you're going to be in front of quite a big audience because it was because it really was i mean I, they had a week and a half or something to go and they were just like okay listen maybe so we were like right we're going to get ready so we called you know sylvia and blah and they were like listen okay get some money together because you're gonna have to expand your live thing a bit and just whatever we're like right like, fine so, so how, how, I mean, how, how did you all, how did you deal with it how did you feel like three years prior or yeah. two or three years prior you were Abbey selling Bill. yeah you were selling white labels out of the Abbey Bill, yeah, yeah and then three years later yeah you're supporting the biggest artist in the world at the yeah, time yeah 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 yeah. Playing to, was, was that stadiums? Was he doing yeah, stadiums? Well, yeah, stadiums. Yeah. So that's like insane. Yeah, it, well, it was. It was naught to sixty. It was and and. But, the I had we always used to say we had a state uh, thing that we used to say, which was we always used to say backs to the wall. What are you gonna do? It was that we used to say. It. Steve used to say <clears> a lot. We used to always say it. backs to the wall. What are you gonna do? And it's this thing of. We're gonna do it. We're just gonna do it. Are you gonna do it? Or are you gonna turn it down? No, we're gonna do it. And uh, and we just we rehearsed, and we we got a drummer, we got a bass player. Because the thing is, we've been playing as a live outfit, but it was, you know, it was console, keyboards, percussion, singer, sax. But we had to now. We were like, right, let's get live, a proper live, drummer. Live. Yeah, <laughs> let's get a bass player. And um, we just, again, one of those natural things, we chose the right drummer because we still drum with him. He's still our drummer to this day, you know. 
many of the band members as people that we you know we picked up along the way that 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 are still with us to this day um it was it was definitely not to 60 um after doing we always i mean we're still probably i i don't even know probably historically probably the only band to have done the jacko prince james brown run no way yeah wow. so i don't you know i can't i don't know who you know i think by the time we've so gone so what, back what were the what, what did you do with james brown and and well, Jack, and obviously they're very connected and also, as well. Did you meet yeah. them? Did you meet them? They were Matt, all very tight with each other as well. So Jacko well, yeah, we, well, Jacko... Jacko was always influenced by James Brown. <coughs> yeah, Jacko, Jacko it was a weird one. Jacko was, were at the time, this is the thing people have to, because a lot of people say, you didn't meet him. I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. 1992, even, I mean, you know, Jacko, often he might be from this far away from you but there'd be five rows of people. And he might turn around and go like this, but that's all you're getting. Mm. Because he was at Megalodon. Yeah. Mm. Like, I was saying, he was the biggest artist yeah, in the world at the time. He so. was at this other whole level of thing. So we were just like, Look, dude, we're on the tour. That, that's fine. Yeah, it's cool. If we get, you know, if we get to sit down with... Not so much hanging out in the green room, but... Yeah, <laughs> it's like, that's the situation. And, you know, you got treated amazingly well on tour. I mean, literally five course meals, blah, this, that, the whole... I mean, it's fully... Um, they took four days. They used to take four days to set up each show. So mm. they would come move in four days before, <laughs> set up the stage, and then set up the backstage. The backstage took them two days alone. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because... There was all of these, you know, these fucking castles and blah and this and that. And there was one room which was just gaming. Yeah? You're going in, you're like, what? Like, computer games just everywhere. It was mad. So it was all of that. Um, Prince was different. Prince, a lot more of a down to earth situation. A lot more kind of like, yo, you know, came, he watched us play from the side of the stage as well. No pressure. Which was bizarre because obviously Ed's playing. I'm looking across, Ed's playing and behind him is Prince. He didn't know and I was thinking, I can't tell him. If I tell him he's gonna, he's gonna do one in his, in his knickers. So, you know, it was, you know, all of that was a very, it was very surreal. You know, we come off stage. Prince was like, yeah, you guys, you know what? He's, you know, he's chatting away. And he's like, in fact, his voice is deeper. Yeah, you know, you guys, you know, whatever. And we were like, yeah, he's like, oh, we said, and we said these words, which I was so glad we, we had the front to do. We were like, if you had any live advice for us, what would you say? And he said, he just looked and he went, okay, okay, right. And he started. Wow. And he went, right. This song, this is what you need to do. This song, you need to do this. This song, blah, 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 wow. such and such. Blah. So you were mentored by Prince. So we're like, <laughs> woo, right, okay. And all of us are like, mental note, mental note, mental note, right, mental yeah, mental right, note. Right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> so he's like, he, he, and, and the thing is, a lot of that stuff is in our show, like even to this day. Wow. Some of the stuff, because he, he was very much, he was all like, He's like, you're doing that song now. Like, really? Uh, okay, okay, I'll let you in on one of them. With no illusions, and the way that that song evolved, that's really down to him. Really? Yeah, that's one of my favourite tracks, actually. Because live, he was live, he was like, you've really got something with this song. He was like, but you finish it too quick. Because we used to play it like a single, and he was like, you finish it too quick. <laughs> he's like that section needs to and he started and we're wow. just like okay cool right okay and that's how I now live the the way that the intro goes and the call and response in it and the blow and the this and the that and it's you know good. Sarah at the end and all of that don't do that if he hadn't said any of that stuff we wouldn't so there was that and JB was just we were in Montreux. Let me guess, you helped him with some of his dance moves? <laughs> <laughs> James Brown, James Brown was, we were in Montreux, we were going to Montreux to do the Montreux Jazz Festival, or the late, is it Claude Nobbs is the guy, I think. And uh, 
they just said, uh, yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're going there as a support. And we were like, oh, okay, great. And they went, yeah, James Brown. And we were like, hey, oh, what? <laughs> And yeah, so we we did that too. So yeah, no pressure for the drummer either. Precise. So we just had this. The, that was the run. That was the diamond. It was literally like this run, and we were just so at the end, and it just this what have we? So is this all before um, the second album? Yeah, this is before the second album. So a lot of a lot of um, yeah, yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot that's happened. Lot happens. So you had. I think there's quite a big gap, wasn't there, between the Yeah, guys. so we, we, yeah, we, we, we were definitely along the Chardin method of, we were, our thing was, you know, a Russian album. It's like, if it's going to take two years, it's taking two years. It's just how it is. So, you know, I think 92 was the first one. I think 95 was the second one. Um, but I think we'd started releasing... That was Prayer for Unity. Yeah, we'd started releasing singles in 94, I think, from it. And we did Midnight first. Uh, but we had also, we had been on the road, I think, in South America. We had done a whole South American tour as well. Um, and some of the places there hadn't seen a band. In fact, I think the last band some of the places had see, seen was James Brown. But from back then, you know. Um, and it was uh, part funded by the British Council. Um, 14 day tour and again that really affected us because it made us look at rhythm differently because we had gone over and had the whole South American experience you know and it really made us go oh okay so you can be slick, cyclical right okay okay alright so you can alright so you can alright oh, okay cowbell right okay fine got it got it got it there's a lot of that there so there's a lot of learning on the road some of the shapings of songs as well, you know, were... were so, so the second album came out. Yeah. Um, what happened then? And that was kind of obviously the end of the Warners yeah. relationship as well. So. Yeah, yeah. We had, we had um, at the time, uh, we had... us all sorts. We were no longer with our manager, which when I look back at it, I'm like, you stupid idiot. I mean, it's off. Anyway, but yeah, we were no longer with our manager, Claire Shave, who who was amazing as a manager, and we were just silly boys. She went on to manage Sarno. Yeah, she went on to manage Sarno. Exactly. Yeah. So we were just yeah silly silly billies and, and young, and, you know, probably too full of ourselves. But um, yeah, so we were no longer and 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 uh, really, I think that Warner's. East West, they were sort of doing the Electra thing as well. Sylvia had had this incredible run, you know, as well of that Buster, you know. I think it's just a Missy, the In Vogue, you know, they had, they had turned over just the most amazing, you know, sold millions and millions and millions of albums, and so their thing was moving, our thing was moving, so it was just one of those things where we had, had a convo with them and we were just like, look. Shall we? Can we just try something else? And they were like, "Yeah, okay." Um, and it really was like that. It wasn't them kind of going, "You're dropped." It was actually us going, "Can we?" You know, because they were just Sylvia and Merlin were just get a huge, big, huge, 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 and we were kind of like a pea in this corner. And we in the UK, um, we then were like, "All right, let's do a gig." And let's see. So we booked the forum and we were like, let's just do it. You booked it yourself? Yeah. Wow. We were like, let's just do it. Let's just see. So we booked the forum and we did it. And it was just a, a, just a, amazing. I remember we hired extra sound system in there as well. Um, it was just great. Great show, good, blah, this, that, all of this stuff. So just remember again thinking, blah. You know, you're here, you're unsigned and you've done this, right? And um, I don't think we quite sold it out, but we were kind of like a three quarters. Do you know what I mean? I mean, downstairs was full. I think upstairs, probably a little patchy, but still people upstairs, whatever. And uh, I remember some record labels had come to see us and, 
um, one of those. Was, okay. Yeah, it was Echo Records, and they just uh, were like, no, 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 we, we want to do this deal. So we just, we did, we did it. And resulted in a fantastic album. Yeah, Absolutely London. Fantastic album. London, yeah, London. London, it was, it was us doing the music, but kind of knowing. It was a lot more, we knew what we want, you know. Yeah, we're, we were very much like, right. It was almost like, it was like one and two squeezed into three, you know, uh, but with knowledge. So we knew what we were doing, sort of thing. Um, and yeah, so those, that was, that was, that was the and three. That's, and that's when also you started to bring in, if I remember correctly, <clears throat> external remixes that took some of the tracks in different directions, like Master yeah. Work, yeah. Hooker T, yeah. like that, yeah. Black Science Orchestra. Yeah. Um, and the remix, the remixes did well. I mean, you know, we had done, we had done pretty well. Well, we we had gone into this is the other thing is the other side of it. We had gone into remixing ourselves production. from about ninety two, ninety three. You know, we had got yeah producing people. One of the bits of advice from America was Sylvia Rohn saying, "Look, you need to start your own thing. Really, you really need to." And of course, that started. You know, at the time we were being looked after by Paul Kennedy. So this Freak Street started. And Freak Street then happens, and we get to you know get to signing. The first, I think, the first three signings on Freak Street were Shauna Scoffrey, Elizabeth Troy, and then the third one, Michelle. I mean, so that was our roster. And I remember thinking, what a roster! It's mad, you know. Um, that is mad. Yeah. So that was you know we were we were doing that as well, and again a lot of it, I think. You know, if you look at it DNA wise, a lot of what we were doing really was better. Chic had a huge influence on us. So our thing was, yeah, you'd be the band, but you'd be the production house as well. So that was our thing. So then it got that whole Which thing. Which then that morphed into, because that, that was the last album in the kind of current form. Yeah. And then the next album was Divas. Yeah. Which was kind of like that, really. Yeah. Lots of, Sarah Precisely. was still involved, but yeah. you had lots of different um, vocalists like Romina Johnson, people yeah. like that. And, yeah. Uh, and Shola was on that album as well. Show, yeah, Shola was on the album. I mean, it, yeah. Again, it was one of these natural consequences. I think we were moving to a time where Sarah needed time, you know, uh, I think um, we exact as you say we had we had done a lot of production for people, and it just seemed like okay, well, hold on, we're gonna put out a record. But how are we get how ah? Oh, I tell you what, this takes the pressure off of Sarah a bit having to do everything. Then we can, okay, so we'll, we'll do it this way. And we literally, in a way, it was like a needs must situation. We knew we had an album to deliver. We were like, how are we going to do it? it? Wasn't that signed in Japan? Yeah, Pony Canyon. Yeah. So we were like, all right, okay, let's, let's, let's do this. And again, it's one of those, it, you know, it's funny. It was indie and it, and it worked. It just, it just worked. It sold well and... And you know whatever deficit it had, it made back and went into royalties. And that, 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 that I guess, um, was part of your transition because that was the end of the influence really. Those last yeah. two albums, yeah. After Hours and, and the one before, yeah. Um, and then you started to move into much more production management. Yeah. So how did that all transition? How did that happen? And, and talk about so you've managed some amazing artists, including Shola. Yeah. So, so talk about some of the artists that you've managed. Ah, uh, okay, right. So. Um, again, a bit of a back to the wall situation. The influence had come to an end, really, a sort of a closing of sorts. We never actually said it was an end, which, you know, it's just people just went and did their sort of separate things. Um, Steve had been diagnosed as being ill, you know, he had cancer. Uh, so Steve was about, you know, getting better and looking after that. And we were all like fully supportive, definitely. Uh, the, the, um, the sort of whole thing of us having, because we had a studio, it was in Ford Square. 
the whole thing about that, well, you know, that the studio shut down, we had moved into another place. And the place that we had moved into, you know, I just remember we had taken on quite a lot of yeah, rent and blah and this and that. So we were there for a couple of years and I just remember going, God, this is, this is really hard. So we stopped there, stopped, sold that place. Um, and I was really in this thing of, okay, I, well, we had started this thing in 97, we had started this urban music seminar. And um, it, we did one in 97, one in 98, 99. And it just started to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So the whole point of the seminar was that you came and you spoke your truth about being in the industry, but from the industry side. So it was a lot less artist focus. It was a lot more panels. We just, I remember the first one, we didn't really know much about what we were doing. So we were like, all right, what we'll do is we'll put a table up. When we got down there and they just happened to be some tablecloths there. So we put the tablecloths over, we, got to, we had hired some microphones, got the mics, and we just said, right, talk people. And they just came, and as people came, we would say, right, you're gonna be on in maybe an hour. And they'd go, yeah, all right, fine, and they'd wait, and they'd just come on, and we just did it like that. Made it up as we went along. And the first one, 500 people came, the next one, 2,000 came, the next one, four, and it just got, you know, it started to just expand. Had a great team of people working as well with it. And, um, it just, it became a bit of an industry sort of hotspot point, you know, everybody would just roll through, talk about the industry, etc. I think the first two or three were more like the industry just, I'd say, I'd say the black music industry in the UK just letting off steam, just kind of going, mate, we've been ignored and blah and blah for, you know, it was that. So I think at first, record company people were kind of a bit scared to come to it because people were just like, no one's signing us. It was a lot of that. But then I think it just, people just it became a lot more sophisticated and people were like, no, okay, how are we going to deal with our business? You know, and that's when it started to get really interesting, 2001, 2002. Then 2003, Dame Dash comes. So he sees it. Now, once Dame Dash sees it, he literally, I remember this so well, he comes he sees it and he's like, no. He's like, who, 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 who's the main, and they were like, that guy there. And he's like, you come. Like this, and we go into this room and he shuts the door. He's like, you realize what you got here? And I was like, oh, I said, yeah, it's pretty big. Because we're at Royal Festival Hall now, right? You know, I think Barbican, Royal Festival Hall level, and it's ramp, right? So, in a day, five, six thousand people are passing through, right? And he was like, this is huge. Urban music seminar? He's like, yo, yo, yo. We're going we're gonna to do this, support you. Next one, next one. So, we're like, fine. So, yeah, he comes and he's like, he puts down, you know, they come and they put down money. They're like, right, here. Here's some money, hold this. And we're like, what the f and they're like, right, come, we're going to help develop it and blah, blah, blah. So the next one, basically, it just whoop, goes up this level. So we're, we end up doing that. So as all of that's happening and being put together, I've come across some singers. A lot of people are saying you should manage because you know, like from doing the seminar, you lo know loads, so many people in the industry. And I'd gone, no, 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 for years. And then I was like, oh come on, let's just try it. So I tried it, got well, this one singer a deal. You know, I also I'd help with various ones. Weirdly, it was a young singer, Louise Satara, I got a, a deal for. Got her one deal, and then weirdly, the person that signed her, was not weirdly at all, actually lost their job or whatever, moved on. So then got her out of that and got her another deal somewhere else, in America or something. So, did that. Um, Shola was, we were sort of tailing, so if you're going 97, I mean 97, when we started that, Shola was really at a height. You might need somebody which the influence had produced, you might need somebody, and it, again, all over the airwaves, <clears throat> playing for radio, huge, blah, this, that, all of that stuff going on. And it was, I mean, it was really weird, because 
on the one hand, it was amazing. On the other hand, it was a runaway train. Because it, I mean, you know, after you do something like that, which is that you've literally, it's true, she was discovered in a train station, Hammersmith. By you? Yeah. So you're like, and then I've come, I've brought her back to D Influence at the D Lab, right? And, and they've, you know, gone, okay, cool, met, fine, let's get her, we're going to do a singing test with her. Did the singing test. She sang Jones all night long, she sang, and she sang it beautifully. And they were all like, yeah, yeah, let's work on it. It was just simple. It's just like, yeah, yeah, let's work on it. Start working on her about third, fourth, tune in. We've gone. Now, Mickey D, who story-wise was the DJ that was at Black Market Records that we had first given our record to, has now become an A&R executive, has signed a young singer from Leicester called Mark Morrison, who's blown. Who he also worked with. Exactly, who he worked with as well. He called us in to work on on that. Then he's gone, if you've got anything else, because right now we're on red hot streak right now. So we're on radio, we're blah, we're this, we're that, whatever. And then he's like, if you've got anything else, and I just say, funny you should say that. Come across this vocalist, blah, blah, blah. He comes and he's like, let me come down and do we book out Jazz Cafe? Do this um, Freak Street night with Jazz Cafe, you know? And she just sang a crazy one that night. She just did so well. Um, I remember Paul Kennedy did this most amazing thing, actually. And it's a trick that actually I went, I've taken with me. It's this thing of just before she was, she was just like, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure about how I look and blah, all this, that. And he was just like, I'll tell you what, come, let's go around the corner. Went around the corner. Remember, he went and she came back and she had this Helly Hansen jacket on. Helly Hansen, right? So she had Helly Hansen jacket on. And it looked, you know, all, anybody that was club had Haley Hansen gear. And he, she had this beautiful Haley Hansen jacket on. And she felt like a million dollars. So when she got on the stage, she sang like a million dollars. And I remember thinking, Paul, that's smart. Like, that was really smart. It's worth the telling. <laughs> yeah, really smart. Anyway, so, yeah, she, and she, we, you know, we landed a deal for her, you know, you know. Um, so right, can I start? Is it true the anecdote about Hammersmith? We, Absolutely, I want So basically, the, the anecdote was you're kind of walking through the station, yeah. and you just hear like some random teenager yeah. singing, yeah. and you're like, "Hang on a minute, you're pretty good. Sign up, make you a superstar." No, that, that's that, that's the that's the, the anecdote. Here's version. my card. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can make. We did we did spot her singing on the station. I was she actually busking, or was she just singing? No, she's just like waiting for a train. No, no, no. The story... <laughs> That's the, what I thought. No, the story is even crazy. Actually, if you... Okay. Okay, here's the... Here's the, the what was I saying? Unabridged. Whatever they say. I don't know what the word is. But, okay. The real story, right? And this is the real story. And it, it it's totally true. Okay. I am going to... I think it's Turn and Green. And I'm going to turn them green because I've got a meeting there. And it's with a distributor, blah, this, that, whatever. <clears throat> and anybody who knows Turn them Green Station knows that at a particular point in the day, if you don't catch either side of the Pinsley or District, you'll go past it. Yeah? Now, I've caught the wrong train and I've gone past it. Okay? So I think, right, hold on, I'll get on the other side and blah, blah, blah. And I catch this other train and I think it's bound to be right. When I get to Turn them Green, it goes past it again. And I'm like, I've missed this. I've missed the meeting. It's not going to happen. So I'm like, right, this, I'm just not having a good day. I'm at Hammersmith Tube Station. I go, right. I come out and I go to catch a cab. Now, we're in the 90s, yeah? I've got dreads. The dreads are down here, yeah? So I'm standing at the taxi rank. Taxi. <laughs> Precisely. I'm like, tell you exactly. You see, you know, this is the thing. That's why I like this company because people, I don't have to explain myself. You know what I mean? This is what happens. That Absolutely. Was South London, totally. So, yeah, it's just like they, what, one cab comes and I'm at the taxi rank. One cab comes, looks, at, and just drives on. Next cab comes, looks, sees me, slows up, drives on. Next cab comes, three now, looks, sees me, 
drives on. I'm like, oh man, like this. Fourth cab comes now, and I'm thinking, come on, please, like this. So I even step a bit into the road. Look, swerves, drives on. I'm like, okay, I'm done. I turn around, I'm vexed. I go into the tube. I'm walking it. I walk into the tube bit. I start, I'm going, I'm in the sort of four area before you go through whatever the barriers would have been. It wouldn't have been the barriers. It would have been a person just checking yeah, your tickets. A man asking for your ticket. Yeah, absolutely, right? So I realised that that's there. I think, all oh, right, I've got to get this ticket and I just hear this voice someone just singing I thought it was humming but she corrected me said she said no I was singing so she was singing she's she, and the thing was again this is another part of the story loads of people go oh yeah yeah but you saw her and she looked fine you know so you're and I was like no mm -hmm. I was like I didn't see her that's the point it was her, just her, her voice yeah. right so she... They made the whole programme like that now. It's called The Voice. Exactly. <laughs> so she... Exactly. Stand my chair. <laughs> so she walks past and that's it. I just... I hear it. I didn't see her. So at this point, I still haven't heard her. And I'm thinking, that voice is really good. And I remember... I remember the convo. In my head, I was like, that voice sounds really, really good. I just wonder. I really, really wonder. Then I thought, it sounded young, though, as a voice. It sounded young which means I'm gonna to have to speak to the parents. Damn, thinking, oh, but can you be bothered? I mean, this is literally what I was thinking. Can you be bothered? Can you be bothered though? Can you be bothered? And just at that point, I remember feeling like somebody was just like, go on, go on, go on. It's like that. And I was just like, oh, okay, like this. So I go, I go to the ticket thing and I just put my money down and I say, I need a ticket. The hilarious thing happens because they do the whole where to, and I'm like, I don't know, I just need a ticket because I'm gonna get through the thing. <laughs> Is it past that barrier? New York, yeah, exactly, exactly. It could be anywhere. Man takes, I don't know what it was, 260 or 270 or whatever it was at the time. Bam, put it down. He's like, All right, go like this. I give you, I show the, the guys like through, bam, go onto the wrong platform first. I'm like, now anybody knows Hammersmith, there's loads of platforms, so I first one's wrong. So I come up the stairs, run. You're still, you're still hearing the voice. Next platform, no voice now. Next platform, I'm like, there's no one there. Then I look across and I see right there, there's a couple of people, they walk in there. And I, just, I run up and I run down and I'm like, which one of you was singing? Which one, who was singing? Was one of you singing? And they point and they say, it's her. And I was like, you? Because I thought it was the taller girl. Like, no, 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 it's you. I said, all right, sing me something. She's like, what? What? I said, <laughs> who are you? I said, sing me something. She's like, I said, can you sing something else? She was like, all right. So she sings, I want to be done. Brandy, Brandy, right? So I'm like, Whoosh. wow. So I'm like, okay, sing another song. Because I thought that could be a flute. Maybe she just knows that one really well. So I thought, sing me another song. So she's like, mm, I know this other one. And she sings Sweet Thing, Shaka Khan. And I just remember just going, and I said, how old are you? She said, 15 and a half. I was like, get out of here. She said, yeah. I was like, tell you what. I said, my name's Kwame Kwan. I said, I'm legit. I'm from a band called The Influence. And just at that point, she went, I saw you perform Michael Jackson. I was wow. at the gig. No, wow. And that was the tie. So, and then I was like, right, okay. So I know he, she knows I was legit here, took it. She took, and she, I said, don't phone me tomorrow. I said, phone me in a week. I said, anybody can phone you tomorrow. You don't know, they're not serious. I said, phone me in one week. And in a week, I, we just all were in the studio. I'd actually almost forgotten. Almost. I, we'd, I, I'd spoken to the band about her, but... It was very much on her. I hadn't, I don't think I'd taken her number. And she just called. And I was like, Phew, thank God you called. Right, okay, listen, da da da. And that's really it. And that, that, so that was the beginning of your management career, like real, because she blew up and everything, and everything went from there. And I was, I, the weird thing was, we were a production company. Okay. But, but you we were very much, we were very much, no, we were very much, Paul managed, Paul Kennedy managed that. 
we were very much like production company, but we were like her big uncles and big aunts musically. In that our thing was right, teach her how to write, teach her how to this, teach her how to that. That was our thing with Shola. And she was like a sponge. She just was like watching. She was a little in the corner of the city. She'd literally be like, right, cool, got it, got it, got it, got it. But she just had this type of voice. The voice was ridiculous, silly. So so fast forward. Yeah. Heavily into management. Yes. Rumour. Yeah. Laura Mavula. Yeah. Uh, which famously I think you found through recommendations on Facebook, is that right? Uh, Rumour was, fa- all of mine are odd, they're all odd. Rumour was, was uh, I had a thing, Kwame's question of the day, I used to pose one question every day. Question about 90 was, who's the most underrated person that you know? And two different people from two different areas of my life said, you need to check this girl out. And I was like, oh no, right, let me just follow my notes. Follow my nose, it was rumour. Yeah, it's like an early algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I followed my nose, it was rumour. So, and I was like, all right, we had the meeting. And she was like, please, we, you know, should we, can we, you know? I was like, yeah, let's so, give us a rumour. And then Laura, and then Laura, Laura, and then Laura took, took you on a whole nother level. Yeah. And she yeah. completely blew up. Yeah. And, and now you've become almost part of the management establishment. You're yeah. vice chair at the MMF. Yes. I You've am. started the Omen seminars again after a break for a while. You started yeah. doing that again. Yeah. Um, so so why now? So what? why is the influence back? Because the first, the first reunion, because you've got a very successful career, you've got everything going on. And, and one of the things we haven't even talked about is the fact that you're now passing this on to your offspring. Yeah. You, you're now, you know, your son has got a very, very successful career. Yeah. He's building, he's... he's doing a lot of the things that you were doing like how many 30 years ago yeah. in the modern world yeah in the digital era he's yeah. doing it himself he's not signed yeah. to anyone he's got complete creative yeah yes yeah. everything That's... like that he's doing very well yeah he is. and yet so you see you've got this long successful career why now the influence 2016 was the first 2016 yeah 20 we a lot of it had to do bless it with steve's passing away steve marston uh, sax pair for the influence, the glue, you know, were, were huge, obviously, massive presence, lovely guy, all of that. And um, we had to bury him and it was, it was really hard. It's like really, really tough burying a band member. It's just, you know, it's not anything I want anybody to have to go through. Um, but after that, I think it was Sarah just said she said we can't we cannot be a band that only meets up at funerals she's like we can't we can't that can't be us and uh weirdly before steve had passed away we occasionally we gone, oh maybe we should do a gig and we're just sort of not you know but definitely his passing away and then so again we still left it another couple of years and then I think in the third year, we were like, let's just get together and just do one day where we jammed. So we just met and we just jammed. Then another year went past. Met and we jammed on one day, right? But that one, so we're in 2015 now, right? Was filmed, right? It was a bit of it was filmed just on the phone, blah, and put up and the comments just went off the scale. So people were like, yo, you got pleaded up, but it was a lot of this. And so, yes, yeah, it was more people power. People were just like, yeah, please, please, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And you just felt, whoa, you know. I remember thinking at the time, I'm like, how am I going to how do you remember like the whole set, you know, all of that tricky, blah, how are you going to, but, um, you know, Ray Cosbert called, was a promoter, Metropolis, and he just was just like, look, he goes, do the jazz cafe. He goes, you can do it. <clears throat> so, do the jazz cafe. You can do it. And I house the band, and they were like, yeah. Because you go back with Ray as well, don't you? Yeah. <clears throat> Freak Street and stuff like that. Break for the border. Yeah, Mona was a compere. Yeah. He was the guy that employed me. So that's 89. You know, 88. So I was just again. Like people who don't know Ray, he also managed Amy. He managed Amy Winehouse, yeah. Part of Metropolis and. Yeah, yeah, Metropolis, exactly. So all of that. So yeah, I mean, and he was just like, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. We're like, all right, fine. So we, we did it. 
And it was a magical night, you know. Uh, I almost felt as though the audience just willed us on, you know, because, yeah, just willed us on, really, to just do it. So, so that's your kind of journey, bringing us up to more or less where we are. Yeah. Um, I was involved in Touch until about 98. And yeah. Then, uh, but mean, meantime, I was I still was a Kiss. I never actually left Kiss. I was yeah. I, I was running um, all the events and clubs and concerts and everything for for and run which my way. wife DJ. Which yeah, exactly. Is that which <laughs> brings it all together again. Is yeah. that one of the clubs that I ran with Rachel B was uh, a night called Flipside. Yeah. Which Moira was one of. I mean, you know, he touched on it before, but Moira was a big club DJ. At the time. She was big. She was playing at lots of lots yeah. of different clubs, and that and that was one of them. Yeah. Who we'll talk about is is part of this um, project as well. Um, and then I was at the BBC for a long time and I've kind of gone full circle and yeah. um, helped initially with my soul and now set up a station Global Soul <clears> and hence the sort of full circle of working back in music and back to my roots and what I started doing. And, and Jamie, you've gone from, so you, you stay to the bitter end <laughs> at yeah. Touch and then... Not quite. Not quite? Okay. Well, I think when I left, there was still, it kind of went on for a little bit longer. Okay. Um, so yeah, but I was there to like 98 as well, and then I kind of started doing TV stuff. Um, but yeah, so that's what, 20 years I ago? I you were there a lot longer than 98. No, I wasn't. I was out, I was out quite soon after I did then. I was at, yeah, I was out at the same time as you. And actually, because it went on for a couple more years with people like Paul McKenzie and Toussaint oh, Davey, yeah. and there, there, was, there was a good two or three years after, and I was gone, I was done, I was out. And um, I guess it took, you know, another, you know, 20 years for me to go, oh, hang on, Touch was actually quite interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that, that, that in the meantime, you're yeah. brushing over mm-hmm. it, but you've had quite a successful uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, I've made, I've made a few things. I've done a few films. You, you've won quite a few awards. You won an award for, when this is before you had your own production company, but you had won an award for um, uh, the Get Banksy film. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you've won BAFTAs with your own company, um, Acme, who does a lot of stuff mm-hmm. for BBC. I, I actually Channel haven't won a BAFTA. I've been BAFTA nominated and Oscar nominated for Banksy film and made a lot of um, good, well-received, you know, and some award-winning drama and doc- mainly documentaries um, on Channel 4, BBC mainly. Um, but So that's, I guess that's my sort of secondary career. But in a funny way, it does all come full circle because one of the things that is the gift that keeps on giving is your contact book and yeah. your relationships yeah. and who you knew when we were all just like fucking around doing stuff. And, um, you know, the people that I knew when I was, you know, coming up and first met you, first met Kwame, all the DJs, all the record shops, all the DJs on the stations, those people are, that's our world now, isn't it? They are now, and in, amongst those are some genuinely, like, famous household names, mm. but it's actually as much the ones that aren't the household names who are still your go-tos, because actually that is the world that we all have the access to. And, um, you know, so when you're making films or whatever you're doing, probably whatever you're doing in life, if you can kind of like have credentials, that's a powerful thing, you know, whether you're a musician or a promoter or a TV guy or whatever it is, like, you know, you've got a bit of weight and history behind you. I think that is now brings us full circle with Touch where I now kind of realise that Touch was, it did, a, it did an important thing. And probably we didn't really recognise it at the time because we were just doing our thing and it was about, we were just really into, into, into the music and, and and I guess one thing that I was maybe realised um, why it needs to kind of be in some way reanimated is that I guess the whole point of Touch was to document something. Mm. That, that was it. Let's yeah. document this thing. I wasn't making, I was I was like occasionally running clubs or playing, but my main thing was to document it. Yeah. And you know, you were like making music, other people were like amazing DJs, other people were had fashion labels or did weird things that you didn't really understand why they were doing it, but it would turn into something else. So I guess documenting that culture and that world that we were all blessed to be a part of was why we had Touch. And in a funny way, it kind of now makes sense to to kind of like, the, the, the archive doesn't exist. So we, the, the point was to archive something and now the archive itself has disappeared. So now there's a bit of a need to, to archive the archive in a way so at the moment we're looking at ways to just to not 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 in a big shouty noisy way like we're not trying to replace you know facebook or youtube we're just trying to say oh this thing happened 
Here it is. Do you want to have a look? Yeah, go there. Have a look. Oh, here's a book. Here's a, an online archive. Here's some photos that people like Eddie Oturi or Des Willie took. That, you know, because remember in those days when we when when you know in the nineties when if Puff Daddy came to London Ooh. or Biggie or not just not just the British Isles, but the Brit no one cared. Like they were just like it was just it was just us that cared. You yeah. know, and so we documented that, and like, actually that's that's what has value, and. No, because the Guardian wasn't writing about it. They went on BBC, they went on Channel 4. No one really cared about that world. So that archive is this kind of thing that still exists. But if we don't archive that archive, then it won't exist. So one of the things we're trying to do now is, um, in a very small way, just kind of like create a little place where that where you could access that. Even if it's just a database or... Because you know, if you Google Touch My Thing, nothing comes up. There's nothing there. Which is, I mean, crazy, for me, that's and, and, and something, we talk, something we were talking about the other day, and, and you were saying that, you know, you can still now, and it ha still happens to me randomly, where people say, oh, I used to read your column, and I was like, that was like 20 years yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were saying, you sometimes you'll turn up to a commissioning meeting, and you'll mention in passing Touch, or somehow Touch will come up, and people are like, oh my God, Touch Magazine, and it mm. maybe changes the conversation a bit. Yeah. But, you know, it's all about... Um, I guess kind of as I said earlier it's, it's all about credentials and even with you know we live in a very media savvy world where everyone's very nervous and kind of like proprietorial and kind of like careful of who they talk to and so if you can open up those routes by saying oh yeah but we were doing this thing so let's do that because we're not trying to kind of exploit you we're not trying to commodify so we're just trying to like keep that, that story going I guess that that does have value, and like even we we made a film um, about grime for BBC Four last year with Rodney P presenting it, and you know that world has and I think and I respect them so much for it. That world, you know, the skeptors and the jammers and the dizzies, like they weren't getting any help from anyone. Mm. They 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 literally they saw how the industry had dealt with the journalists for that like, fuck that we'll do it ourselves, yeah. and they're now all global superstars, you know, mm. and. We making a film about grime now, it's quite hard because they don't, they don't need to talk to the BBC or to me. Or to, but then if you go, oh, but it's tough. So there's, there's a little a lot, bit a lot of... A those artists paved the way for people like Stormzy. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, and there is a, just a bit... Even, you know, so like we, you know, we're working with Rodney P that opens doors and I used to run types that opens doors. And it's all about nuance and, you know, we're not going to misrepresent you. We're, just, we're not trying to talk to you because you're now... You know, because you're now Stormzy and you've won all these awards, or you're now this person and you're. We're trying to talk to you because we're actually interested in you, interested mm. in your story. And we would have been interested in you 30 years ago yeah. when no one else was interested. Uh, and, you know, make of that what you will because that is the truth. And I think there is a. In a weird way, not, not to sound pious, but there is an honesty about people that are interested in culture. And the people that are interested in culture are the people that did work in the record shops or ran a club or. We're just driven to, you know, and I, that wasn't me. My, I guess, Touch's thing was to like harness, get harvest those people together and allow them to tell their story because that was an important thing they all did. And, you know, if you're running some little label and you might only sell a few hundred records, but those records like made a massive, now those records are being sampled all over the world and they're influential. Um, and then you have people like Kwame coming through who was an underground white label that becomes an underground hit that then becomes your supporting Prince and Michael Jackson and James Brown. All of that's really interesting. And I guess for me, it's it's important that we don't lose that because if in, just for argument's sake, in 50 years from now, 10 years from now, if it's all, everything's online. If you Google shit and it's not there, yeah. it didn't happen. It, ain't there. it, it didn't happen. happen. Yeah. We're not gonna find the records, we're not gonna find, there are, there are no, there is no archive of pirate radio. It doesn't exist. So um, that whole culture, I guess, just needs a little space to sit. And I guess that's why you're putting your show on and, you know, we want to yeah. be a part of it. Only because it's... And the interesting thing about the show is, the is, that, is that all of us, through our different journeys and everything, are coming back together. And, and we used to run events at the Jazz Cafe back in the day. We used to run our own events and stuff. And, and the other dimension to it is Moira, who's now prolifically back DJing, she runs a, a Monday night uh, a chip shop, uh, Mobile Mondays with business. Not a chip shop, 
Sorry? At chip shop, not a chip shop. Oh, sorry. Just, just no, there's there's not any chip shop. <laughs> the chip shop. Yeah, <laughs> the chip shop in Brixton. <laughs> um, uh, every Mondays, which, which is you know, a great night. Um, so with um, Billy Business as well, yeah. as part of it. So we're all sort of coming back together. Yeah. So obviously we need to say where it is, the Jazz Cafe, the 21st of September. Yeah. Um, so moving forward, yeah. what, what does this mean for the influence? So you, you did the, the first gig in 2016. 2016 yeah. You're now back at the Jazz Cafe. Yeah. Are you going to be recording? I also know, I understand there's loads of um, unreleased material that's never seen the light of day as well. What, there, there, there is, is some. Is there more The Influence coming? Is there a future for The Influence? There is some. It's an interesting one because I've learned, as everybody says, never say never. But there is this thing of... Uh, one one thing we learned with doing the show in 2016, the reason why it happened was that we only focused on that show. We didn't go, what else is there? What ha blah, blah. Because when you start doing that, weirdly, what happens is, is that it's almost like a, a pressure sandwich and you're at the bottom and you're a pea and you can get squashed, right? So our way of kind of diffusing that was to just kind of go, no, it's just about this show. And in a way, I kind of go, it's just about this show. It, having said that, we have, we have had two writing sessions that have gone really well. But wow. it's, it's really just about, it's like, do the show, get the writing sessions done, and then, you know what? If we can get it together, get back in the studio and do something, then we'll do something. But it's that thing of don't, don't, don't push it, don't force it. Especially now, there we say at this age, you're kind of like, you know, you're not, we're not doing it. You're not doing that because oh, you know what? I've got to do promo now, and I got to da 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 da. You're doing it because you're like, you know what? This feels like the right thing to do right now. You know. And however else, I mean, you know, the touch thing, really, we were just chatting and it's like, hey, why don't we, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Quan said, let's do it with the touch, it was like, no touch doesn't actually exist. Well, uh, although, although, I mean, you brought up the, the archive thing, we've been talking, various people, various people have been talking about doing some sort of archiving project for, for a while. And that's why I guess that's important that, you know, touch does need to come back in a way, if nothing else, to document everything that we did over that period. Mm. It's the knock on. I yeah. just think it's the knock on. You know, there are, we all will never realise, you know, you had touch and you were there and you existed in your offices, but you were, the messages that you were sending out, they were like Morse code. Right? And that Morse code was working its way into the street and telling people, do you know what? It's possible that I might be on a shelf in WH Smith's through doing what I love doing, it's so important, you know, that's what it gave us all, it gave us all that, it was like, you know what, there's this, you know, everybody had told us that the only way in which we could exist was by going up this A road, mm. yeah, and touch came and it was just this side road, this B road, that got Z you, road. yeah, but just, <laughs> no, but just got you, literally, you know, and you learn a whole load of stuff on the way, met a whole load of interesting people, and bam, you were you were you were you weren't stuck in traffic, which is where everybody had been. weren't going forward, were completely suppressed by mainstream media. You know, it was it created this thing, and then by creating it as well, taught loads of us to do it because it was that thing of well, they did that, so you know, there we sat seminar wise. We we're like, well, let's just do that. And then we had. With the seminar, we used to have a magazine that went with the seminar. Do you know what I mean? We would just start uh, do a magazine for the seminar of all the speakers that are here. Right, okay. So we were approaching it from an education style, but it's still that thing of telling people's truths of the time. You know? Very, very important. Really, really important. And, you know, I was talking, I was talking to Jammer. Uh, and we were at Shoreditch House. And he just said, he said... Uh, I saw him and he just looked at me, he was like, you all right? He said, what's your name? I said, Kwame, Kwame. Mm. He said, what did you do then? Like this, and I was like, well, I was in a band, it's de-influence, 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 mm. mm. 
anything else? I said, yeah. Did a thing called the Urban Music Seminar. Urban Music Seminar, he went. Yeah. Because again, you realise now, everybody's got different parts to their life. Right. And different people come in in different rates. And he went, Urban Music Seminar? He said, yeah. He goes, the one on the South Bank? Yeah, I said, yeah. He said, no. He said, you'll never believe. He said, tell you what. Did you know? He said, our first bit of video of us filming MC's battling was outside the seminar. Wow. And I was like, get out of here. He said, no. Nah. He said, all of that early footage, he goes, that's where it came from. He said, I still got the tapes. He said, that's where it came from. He said, it was outside. He said, do you remember the, I said, yeah. He said, the, I said there was, we, we would have the, the talks going on inside, but outside there was MCs mm. just battling, yeah, battling, yeah. battling, yeah, battling. I forgot about that. I yeah. that was actually right. It was, it was there was always this us going around it, wasn't yeah. it? it was like a sort yeah. of universe. So he was just like, look, you know. And again, there was a lot of people involved. You know, Andrea, you, yeah. you had Nikki Charles, you had Natalie Wade, you had, there were untold people that literally fought tooth and nail to make that seminar. I was just a figurehead, like spokesperson. Sure, I, one day I had an idea to put a, this a thing on, but in terms of developing it, the team were just ridiculous. And also, classically, you know, you had Steve and Dean Flores just going, yeah, we'll bankroll the first one. Like, it's just good, good idea. Come, let's do it. And they'd always do it with my, I had an idea, they'd just be like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. It was that. And again, having somebody behind you that just, you have a madcap idea and the, someone's just like, don't worry, we'll catch you. We'll catch you. We got you. Let's go. It's an amazing thing. Where it leads, no one knows. And that's really... So, so, to, so to bring it back, because you're, um, and to sort of round things off, you're now at the sort of cusp of like where things are now. Yeah. Um, with your, for example, with your son, which we didn't mention, is Blue Love Beats. Yeah. Um, which is like the cutting edge of where things are, right at the, the hub of like where all the heat is at the moment musically. Yeah. And yet you're kind of doing your own thing from thirty years previous. I mean, yeah. Firstly, what, what does your son make of all that? What's what's he all? You know, what's what's he think about it all? Well, he he really want he you know he when we played <clears throat> that first time he was a support band. Blue Lab supported the influence, which again for me was just a cosmic moment. <laughs> really, you that know. Must have been surreal for both of you. Yeah, and then Maura was DJ, oh, so wow. you literally had family uh, all <laughs> over the. You know, Tali was involved. She as well, in some way. So it's just you know the whole thing was just like wow, you know. Tali's like party planner. She's like Miss. I can make you all have a great time. <laughs> you know, she's brilliant at all that. How does it feel within the family unit, particularly within your son and you, because obviously he's making yeah. music, you're back um, performing and everything. Where, yeah. Whereas, I guess, I don't know how old he is, but I guess that's a long distance fight. He probably even wasn't around when you first, you know, um, Again, another, you're having all your success and everything. And, but another reason for doing it, you know, because don't, you know, some of Ed's kids were in the audience. Do you know what I mean? There were people, you know, Sarah's sisters, they were like little talisman when we were in d because they were like this high and whatever. And, you know, they were in the audience when we played in 2016 and they're singing all the BV parts because they knew them backwards, mm. do you know what I mean? And you're just like, wow. So there's a lot of family love in the room. Um, but yeah, with, with, yeah, tremendously proud of Blue Lab Beats and everything that they've, that they've achieved and yeah, you know, they've gone on to be coming or they're becoming the, the sort of the go to production team for, you know, the Jazz Karis, James Vickery, yeah. um, the guy that you were telling me about outside. Joe Hertz. Joe Hertz as well, they've just done and so yeah. And then Mulata Stat K's had them perform and all of this stuff. So you and they you know, latest Apple advert they were in, you just sit there and you go, Wow. Um, but yeah, and it was brave of him as well because he was in a band before 
And he could have, you know, they, the band had played Glastonbury and everything, and he could have just stayed in it. And he, at the time, he was like, no, this isn't where I, I end up. I'm, I'm going to leave that band, who were on, you know, they were and doing quite well. And he's steps into production and remixing yeah, as well. Yeah, he's just, he's did, done his thing, and, and it's come good. And he was, he, he was right to do it. I mean, at the time, I remember scratching my chin when he said, I'm now, I'm going to split, and I'm going to do this. My heart's in this, you know, new jazz, blah, jazz tronica, this is where I'm at. Which has now blown up and it's a yeah. massive scene now. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, so he's definitely, uh, yeah, he's good, he's good. Uh, okay, good. well it's been a serious journey down memory lane. Hasn't it? Thank you so much. Saturday, the 21st of September, Touch Magazine, Global Soul, Mobile Mondays, DJs, myself, JM, Jamie DeCruz, Moira Miller, Billy Business, and of course, the influence live.